Diamonds, timeless, beautiful, symbols of love. They come in different colors, shapes, and sizes. Their value measured by carat, cut, and clarity. They are the world's most precious gem. But in West and Central Africa, their cost has been greater than anyone could imagine. Literally millions of people have lost their lives as a result of blood diamonds. Diamonds funding wars. They put us together and ordered our arms chopped off. You hear people crying, rebels attacking them, women being brutalized, people being shot at. Diamonds linked to terrorists. The connection between Al-Qaeda and diamonds first came to my attention shortly after the 9-11 attacks. It is a story few know. If you ask anyone on the street passing by where did you get your diamond ring, they're going to say down at the corner jewelry store. This is the story of blood diamonds. It is a land filled with paradox, squeezed into the landscape of Africa's western coast. Sierra Leone is one of the poorest nations on earth, ranked second to last on the United Nations Human Development Index. The average income of its citizens is a scant $220 per year. Conversely, Sierra Leone is rich in natural resources. Verdant tropical forests stretch far into its interior. Just under its fertile soil lies a bounty of the world's most sought after gems. The value of Sierra Leone diamonds is about $200 a carat on average, which is a lot bigger, a lot higher than, than other diamonds. Diamond dealers, the people who know about diamonds, say that Sierra Leone diamonds are special. They have a special light to them, special color. In a land beset with abject poverty, the discovery of diamonds seemingly should have brought great fortune. The pedigree of being a diamondiferous country has always been a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's a blessing because it brings with it the promise of vast wealth and riches that can be lavished upon the people of the country. But on the other hand, it also invites chaos. In Sierra Leone, it's mostly been chaos. From 1991 to 2001, an uncommonly brutal war raged between government forces and a rebel group called the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front, a war funded in part by diamonds. They said they were fighting for democracy, but they fought against civilians. And they used diamonds to fuel the whole thing. They used diamonds to get the guns to fight the war. It's estimated as many as 75,000 were killed, often in the most horrific manner. Two million people, about half the population, were displaced. It was the most ruthless rebel war in, in modern history. Today, the remnants of violent conflict litter both rural villages and crowded towns. The trauma of war's fury is still visible on the faces of those subjected to both physical and emotional wounds. The war in Sierra Leone did, did huge damage to the physical infrastructure. It certainly did huge damage to, to people and to people's lives. There's hardly anybody who hasn't got an atrocity story to tell. I bet it did. Where did I chop me to hand? That very day when they chopped my hands off, I didn't expect to leave. I didn't believe I would be able to sit down and talk to you as I do now. I knew I was finished. Before the war, Ibrahim Fafana worked the mines, pulling rough diamonds from the ground in Sierra Leone's Kono district. In April 1998, 
the RUF attacked his village. The rebels they are holding camp inside the town. When they came to town, they were in full combat uniform. They had weapons, RPGs. Rebels confronted Ibrahim's neighbor. Now they didn't know that soldiers say. One of the soldiers asked him for diamonds, and he told him he had no diamonds. After me, to the next house, a soldier followed him out, shot, and killed him. People were running helter skelter. I was in the woods. My wife and child were at home. They were locked in. Separated from his family, Ibrahim and other villagers were captured. They gave us their loot to carry to another town called Tumbudu. When we got there, they already had other captives and they placed them in a house. Ibrahim and five others were bound together outside the dwelling. There were 53 people in the house. Then they set the house on fire. Though spared from a fiery death, an act of unthinkable barbarity awaited Ibrahim. The mother said to be say, being one of the people then. They told us that we voted for Tijan Kaba, and it was because of our vote that's why he won the election. They said that by cutting off our hands, we would lose the capacity to actively participate in politics, to elect anyone into government. I do all can cry a holler. I yelled and screamed. The rebels were laughing at me. They told me to stretch my arms out, but I said that was not going to happen. They used their guns and hit me all over my body, and that weakened me. This hand, they laid it out on the mortar and chopped it off. They laid the other one out and chopped it off too. Left for dead, Ibrahim crawled to safety. It was only later he learned of his family's fate. What they did was set our house on fire with my wife and children inside. What could I do at that moment? I was a captive. They did what they wanted to do. Today, Ibrahim lives in a camp for war wounded and amputees, one of many scattered across the country. In Sierra Leone, more than 10,000 people suffered a fate similar to Ibrahim's. Amputation was the trademark atrocity of the RUF. They committed every war crime in the Geneva Conventions and then invented one of their own, intentional mutilation of non-combatant civilians. Most often, hands and legs were severed. But no body part was immune from RUF axes and machetes. And the whole purpose of it was to serve a military strategy, to induce tectonic plate shifts of uh, population flow away from the areas that, that the RUF wanted under its control. And of course, that was just the diamond mines. In the 1990s, an epidemic of war and human rights abuse spread across Africa. Angola, Liberia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo were also embroiled in brutal civil wars. Collectively, an estimated four million people perished. What connected each conflict was the currency used to fund them. Diamonds. Conflict diamonds are diamonds that are mined and sold by rebel movements, particularly in Africa, and that are used to finance arms purchases. The rebels insisted on having diamonds. When they discovered diamonds in Kono, they realized it was their only source of outside support. If those rebels were right here, doing farming, they would not have their outside support and the war would have been over a long time ago. I would not have had my hands amputated. The human cost of blood diamonds in Africa has been immense. 
Literally millions of people have lost their lives as a result of conflict and blood diamonds. And appalling atrocities have occurred, from the hacking off of arms and legs in Sierra Leone, to terrible massacres in Angola, to just widespread destruction. So what good have those deposits brought to those countries? None. They've been a curse. What have people got who've lived in the conflict zones? Generally, you'd have to say misery, enslavement, death, disease. As citizens in four African war zones suffered, diamonds from those countries flowed freely into the world diamond market. Our estimates are that 10 to 15 percent, possibly even higher, of the world diamond trade was blood diamonds. Today, blood diamonds mined in the 1990s still grace the hands and necks of unsuspecting customers who have little clue of their brutal origins. A conflict diamond doesn't come with a little tag on it that says conflict diamond. I am from a war zone. It doesn't have a little sort of like, like skull and crossbones nicked in the side. It's just another piece of rough. If you ask anyone on the street passing by, where did you get your diamond ring? They're gonna say down at the corner jewelry store. They're never gonna know beyond that where the diamond originated. The modern story of how diamonds are brought to the market is inexorably linked to one company that took a stone and transformed it into a multi-billion dollar industry. An exquisitely hand-cut and polished diamond is a creation of elegance and artistry. It's also big business. Catering to a diamond-hungry public is a vast worldwide industry. Botswana, Russia, South Africa, and Canada are some of the largest diamond-producing nations. But diamond mines are located in more than 20 countries and yield 20 tons of gem quality stones a year. This started out as a 250 carat piece of rough out of the Congo. Uh, it was a complicated piece, came out deflawless, over 100 carats. In today's market, a stone like this is probably a $15 million diamond. Diamonds start as mined rough. Artisans then cut and polish stones into precious gems. And working on big diamonds like that is very nerve-wracking. It's a high-stakes game, the true value of each stone unknown until it reaches the polisher's wheel. This one I'm working on over here uh, will be an oval or a pear shape. It started off 20 carats and it'll finish around about seven. Nowhere is the diamond business more profitable than in the United States, where half of the world's diamond supply is sold. Worldwide, the diamond retail business rakes in more than $60 billion a year. Okay, this just beautiful necklace. Our love affair with diamonds began two and a half thousand years ago. Throughout most of history, diamonds were the exclusive property of royals, aristocrats, and the very rich. Few others could afford them. Diamond discoveries were rare, scattered deposits found in or around riverbeds. The true source of the gems remained unknown until the 19th century. The modern diamond business originated in Africa. It originated with the big 19th century African diamond discovery. In 1869, an 83 and a half carat diamond was discovered near the Orange River in South Africa. An unparalleled diamond rush followed. As prospectors arrived by the thousands, the mining town of Kimberley was established in 1873. It was home to the region's biggest diamond find. The main significance of the Kimberley mine is it's the first time that people identified the true diamond source. The source of diamonds is a subterranean volcanic pipe named after the mining town where it was first discovered. Diamonds are created in the upper mantle. They're transported from this 100 mile deep part of the upper mantle to the surface in a kind of volcano called a kimberlite 
pipe. Under exactly the right conditions, a fairly rapid ascent with exactly steady conditions of pressure and temperature, that little volcano, that kimberlite pipe, will deliver to the surface a stream of diamonds. Kimberly marked the first discovery of actual diamond producing pipes. Suddenly, large scale industrial mining became feasible. The largest of the kimberlite pipes was found on land owned by two unsuspecting farmers. Well, the original De Beers brothers were just farmers. Diamonds were discovered on their land. A syndicate was formed and bought them out. The price paid for the brothers' land, 6,300 pounds. Which they no doubt thought of as a stupefying sum at the time, and probably got into their wagons and rode off down the dusty road, thinking what a wonderful deal they'd done. In retrospect, they could have made much more. The De Beers Brothers Farm would eventually produce 14 and a half million carats of diamonds. In its infancy, the diamond business was a disorganized assortment of small companies and individuals staking claims on diamond-rich land. Few possessed the foresight of British entrepreneur Cecil Rhodes. His vision was to create a titanic empire in which he would control not just the diamonds in his claim, but the diamonds in the next claim next door and the one beyond that and the one beyond that. Rhodes realized the threat of an unrestrained diamond business. Once diamonds started coming online as much as they did in the late 1800s, it was clear to him that the price of diamonds was going to crash if all of the diamonds ever discovered were put on market. Rhodes believed this could be curtailed by a strictly controlled worldwide monopoly. For almost a decade, he gobbled up competitors. In 1888, he founded De Beers Consolidated Mines, named after the brothers on whose land diamonds were discovered. And by the age of 35 in 1888, he controlled 90% of the world production of diamonds. The monopoly was charged with hoarding the diamonds and controlling the supply to be right in line with demand. We have an idea that diamonds are rare, but they're not. What created the value in diamonds is withholding the supply, making sure that the supply is regulated and, 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 and there's never a flood of diamonds on the market. That's one thing that De Beers did right from the beginning. As decades passed, demand grew, in part due to De Beers' brilliant marketing. In 1948, under the direction of Chairman Ernest Oppenheimer, De Beers launched one of the most powerful advertising campaigns in history. The words were simple, but convincing. His genius was in coming up with the advertising campaign that made a diamond synonymous with human love, and in particular, the right of marriage and engagement. Because he rightly concluded that he could get people to pay quite a bit of their percentage of their income to buy a diamond in order to pledge their love. De Beers managed its monopoly through the central selling organization, since renamed the Diamond Trading Company. Its London headquarters became the end destination for every diamond De Beers mined or bought on the open market. Even today, the company's rough is still sorted, valued, mixed, stockpiled, and sold here. De Beers sells its diamonds in London 10 times a year at a sale called a site, because it's the first site you get of the diamonds. To this day, people can't believe you send the money first and then you get your product. But I guess that reiterates the importance of supply. You have the goods, you're king. If you own the mines, if you own the product, you're the boss. <laughs> De Beers tells them pretty much what the price is going to be, and that's the end of it. You can either pay the price and go home with the goods, or refuse to pay the price and you'd probably never be invited to another site again. For close to a century, De Beers controlled approximately 90% of the world's rough diamonds. But its business model 
had drawbacks. There was a uh, thought in De Beers, or policy in De Beers until the late 1990s, that the company really had to control most of the diamonds that were, that were produced in the world. And that meant mopping up supplies of diamonds no matter where they were produced, no matter how they came onto the market. In the 1990s, some were smuggled into the market from countries afflicted by brutal civil wars. And when diamonds became linked to death and destruction, an entire industry would come under fire. Until about 1999, De Beers and the diamond industry were in a state of denial on all of this. Approximately 60% of the world's rough diamonds come from Africa. Botswana and South Africa are rich in underground kimberlite pipes, making large-scale industrial mining possible, profitable, and easily controllable. If you find one of them, you can just put a fence around it, dig straight down like a root canal job, and haul up the gravel and sort out the diamonds. Diamond revenues in these countries have helped build infrastructures and national economies. But diamonds in many other African countries are spread out like pebbles across thousands of square miles. Through erosion, rivers have transported these rough diamonds for millennia. Mostly mined by individuals, alluvial deposits have brought little national benefit. You don't need big companies, you don't need big equipment. They're easy to get at, and they're easy to get at for rebel armies. Alluvial deposits are prevalent in Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Angola, the country where conflict diamonds first came to the world's attention. It's got everything, offshore oil, it's got diamonds, it has all kinds of resources, and it's just a sad, dismal tale of human greed and of, of the most revolting conditions of exploitation. For more than two decades, Angola suffered through a seemingly endless civil war. It began in 1975, when colonial power Portugal granted Angola independence. The Soviet-backed MPLA, the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, controlled the government from the capital of Luanda. A rival rebel army called UNITA, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, was led by Jonas Savimbi and supported by the United States. After the Cold War ended, superpower aid dwindled and left both sides stripped of cash and arms. But Angola had natural resources for the taking. The government relied on oil. UNITA turned to diamonds. At the beginning of the 90s, they needed money for arms. And so they strategically decided to take over the diamond mines in northern Angola. In 1992, UNITA rebels seized 60 to 70 percent of Angola's diamond mines. The war was funded in one part by the sale of diamonds extracted by people often in conditions of enslavement. Diamond revenue bankrolled UNITA's war machine. Fierce battles were waged between the rebels and government forces. Civilians were often caught in the crossfire. Close to a million people lost their lives in the conflict in Angola unnecessarily. The war sparked an investigation by Global Witness, a small London-based non-governmental organization that focuses on the links between human rights abuse and environmental exploitation. Angolan diamonds are some of the best diamonds in the world. 80% of Angola's diamonds are gem quality. These are the diamonds that everybody wants. And that was one of the main problems uh, for Angola. And, uh, one of the, the blessings for UNITA. UNITA had little trouble finding buyers for its illicit stones. UNITA had a very sophisticated sales system in place. Diamond dealers from all over the, the diamond dealing world would come to UNITA. They would even form joint mining partnerships. Those diamonds went straight into the market in Antwerp and they got an enormous amount of money for them. $3.7 billion worth of diamonds from Angola went through UNITA's hands during the 1990s. Not all transactions involved cash. 
Arms dealers peddled old weapon stockpiles from Bulgaria and other East European countries. Arms dealers would fly in and would directly negotiate arms for diamonds. They would bring their diamond evaluator with them and there would be no cash. This would simply a diamond for arms transaction. Somebody would fly a tank down to Angola in a Russian IL-76, landed on a little bush strip that couldn't be picked up by satellite at night. Down goes the back, up into the light goes a guy with a sack of diamonds, representing Jonas Savimbi. Some little guy sits down with a table, paws through the sample, decides what they're worth, off goes the tank. It's the AK-47 that was prevalent in Angola in many of the conflicts in Africa, but also sophisticated weaponry systems. But there were one stage, UNITA even had MiG planes, uh, and all these were, you know, funded partially by diamonds. Despite a 1994 UN brokered peace agreement that promised a national unity government, hostilities continued. Then, in 1998, the UN Security Council imposed sanctions banning the export and trade of Angolan diamonds not certified by its government. It was a total failure. There was no attempt to implement it. Even the Angolan government, who was at war with UNITA, uh, accepted diamonds from UNITA areas and exported them as their own. At the end of 1998, Global Witness released the findings of its conflict diamond investigation in an expose entitled, A Rough Trade. The reaction that Global Witness received from the publication of our report in 98 was explosive. Nobody understood what was really happening, the impact of these diamonds being sold so openly, so easily, in exchange for millions of dollars. Really, for us, it was horrific that consumers were basically funding the war in Angola, and we felt that was unacceptable. A stinging indictment of the diamond industry, the report's greatest criticism was leveled at industry giant De Beers. De Beers was very prominent in buying Angolan diamonds and also diamonds that came from UNITA. As proof, Global Witness cited De Beers' annual reports. From 1992 to 1997, in every annual report, they talked about their outside buying power, how strong they were on the market to buy up these diamonds that were flooding onto the market that would have threatened the price stability of the diamond trade. De Beers defends its purchase of Angolan rough. Well, first of all, De Beers, to make it absolutely clear, has never bought conflict diamonds. During the 90s, we were working in partnership with the official government in Luanda, purchasing diamonds, exporting, paying revenues, etc. They dispute the definition of conflict tied to diamonds purchased before 1998. So up until the point of, of sanctions being imposed, there was, by definition, no conflict diamonds in that country. The diamond industry likes to think that conflict diamonds only started in 1999, when in fact it was going on way before that. Prior to the imposition of sanctions, everybody in the world was still very hopeful that the UNITA rebels would engage in a lasting, sustainable peace. Unfortunately, in retrospect, we can see that that, um, that hope was in vain. And when it was recognized that the rebels in Angola were no longer going to participate in any significant way in building peace in that country, the United Nations imposed sanctions and De Beers immediately, swiftly and effectively started working with the United Nations to ensure that those sanctions were fully implemented. In October 1999, De Beers announced plans to close its Angolan buying offices. To those personally affected by the war, the definition of a conflict diamond matters little. The human cost for conflict diamonds in Angola in particular is very plain to see. You only have to look at the amputees walking in Luanda. Angola was one of the most heavily landmined countries in the world and still is, and people are still losing their lives as a result. The knowledge that diamonds were funding the loss of life and limb in Angola did little to stop the carnage. And when another African nation descended into chaos, diamonds would once again be linked to a human tragedy of historic proportions. They would go into towns, they would drag people out of their houses, they would butcher them.
Scattered throughout eastern and southern Sierra Leone are hundreds of square miles of soil abundant in rough diamonds. The real underlying problem where conflict diamonds are concerned is the uncontrolled nature of diamond digging in countries where you have alluvial diamonds. Easily accessible to opportunists, corrupt governments, and rebel armies, diamonds have colored much of Sierra Leone's past and nearly destroyed a proud nation founded on principles of freedom. In 1462, a Portuguese explorer came upon a stunning stretch of Africa's western coast, crowned by steep hills. He felt they looked like a crouching lion, and so he gave the name Serra Layoya. Over the years, that name has been changed to what we know it today as Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone played a leading role in the thriving 18th century slave trade. It was from here that the famed slaves of the Amistad revolt set sail. Conversely, the country also attracted the attention of British abolitionists. They helped bring freed slaves from the United States, Great Britain, and Canada to Sierra Leone. The liberated slaves were settled in a coastal town called the Province of Freedom, later renamed Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. A lot of ex-slaves were brought here, and these mixed with the local population, and it was quite a vibrant place. Over time, there was a lot of intermingling among these settlers, which gave rise to a totally new culture in West Africa known as the Creole culture. As a British colony, Freetown became a center of education and progressive ideas. The rest of the country remained mostly undeveloped until 1930, when diamonds were discovered. And since then, diamonds have continued to play a very big role in our economy. A single company, the Sierra Leone Selection Trust, the SLST, was issued exclusive mining rights. Quickly, an illicit network of diamond miners and smugglers developed. Contraband rough was secretly carried into Liberia and Guinea. Monrovia, Liberia became a bit of a boom town as diamond purchasers from European houses realized the wealth of cheap diamonds that were available in Monrovia. In the early 1950s, new diamond deposits were discovered. In 1955, there was this great diamond rush where everybody went to the diamond mines in search of quick wealth. So the monopoly that SLST had was threatened. When I lived there in the 60s, um, the Sierra Leone Selection Trust had an army of 500 men. They had two helicopters and they had trucks and their whole business was to round up illicit diggers. Despite widespread smuggling, Sierra Leone officially exported a lucrative two million carats of diamonds a year. The revenue was critical after Great Britain ended its colonial rule. When Sierra Leone got independence in 1961, the prospects looked pretty good. It had a fairly good infrastructure. There was a railroad, there was a network of highways, there were schools, there was a university. But many of the institutions were very, very fragile. Sierra Leone's decline began in 1967, when Shiaka Stevens became prime minister. He, over time, embarked on a highly centralized, one-party form of government, which adversely affected the living standards of the people. Important institutions in this country, like the, the military, the police, we are all corrupted and politicized. The government claimed 51% of the Sierra Leone Selection Trust shares. Gradually, the diamond industry was nationalized. The government brought in all kinds of shady characters. They brought in uh, American mafia. There were just an incredible range of very, very bad people involved in the, in the diamond business. Official diamond exports went from, you know, two, three hundred million dollars a year down to almost nothing. Over the next two decades, funding for social services evaporated. Education, health care, and infrastructure collapsed. The press and social dissent were restricted. Pretty soon, you had a state in free fall. 
A lot of um, young students, university students, were radicalized during this time and by this experience. And they, they formed a kind of an opposition that fed into the early days of the rebel movement that started up in the early 90s. One of the rebel leaders was former Army Corporal Fode Senko. Fode Senko, I know him very well, is like a chameleon. Chameleon in the sense, a chameleon can take any color. The way he sees you is the way he appears to you. At times he looks nice, simple, loving, but Fode Senko is very difficult to accept and Fode Senko cannot keep to his words. Today he is black, tomorrow he is white. Sanko allied himself with a vicious rebel just across Sierra Leone's border. We will fight street to street, house to house, and we'll defeat them. Charles Taylor from Liberia had a big plan to create Greater Liberia, and that really involved attacking Sierra Leone. But also, he had a strategic need to take over the diamond fields in Sierra Leone to pay for his own war and to pay for the war in Sierra Leone. No, master! No slave. No slave. There's nothing. You have to read your poem, sir. Together, Taylor and Senko gave birth to the nascent Sierra Leonean rebel army known as the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front. Charles Law promised them that after his own war, he's going to help them to create a revolution in Sierra Leone. In 1989, Taylor and his followers launched a civil war in Liberia. Sanko set up a base in western Liberia along Sierra Leone's border. From there, he began to recruit and train his army. Sanko's foot soldiers were mostly uneducated and easily indoctrinated. There was a lot of poverty, but there were a lot of disaffected young men who were very easily picked up by Fode Sanko. It wasn't too hard to get this thing rolling. In March of 1991, the RUF invaded Sierra Leone. Many people believe that the RUF actually had a genuine cause, a grievance against the government. The so-called legitimate government of Sierra Leone squandered the diamond revenues. They stole the money that should have gone for development. No money was going back to build schools or hospitals. The infrastructure in Sierra Leone was atrocious. Just a year after the RUF invasion, a military junta staged a successful coup. It would be one of three governments to combat the RUF over the course of the war. But to Sanko, it mattered little who sat in the presidential palace. He was a power thirst man who wanted to govern this country, Sierra Leone, at all costs. The RUF swept uncontested into lucrative diamond districts in the east. Sanko's rebel army brutalized all who stood in the way. So I've been there as I picked this guava. I was picking guava from a tree when I saw them. Some wearing red, some had red ribbons, ten of them. They asked me why I was frightened. They literally fell on me and sexually assaulted me. RUF soldiers gave themselves gruesome nicknames, such as Bloodmaster, Wicked to Women, and The Killer. They don't go around the village and don't capture some of you about they surrounded the village and captured about 55 of us. They put us together and then called upon a boy known as the killer. They decided to sacrifice someone. They brought a lady from the Limba ethnic group and she was killed. Illusions of the RUF as liberating heroes were soon dispelled. Terrified citizens fled villages and towns. By November 1993, more than 370,000 had been displaced. The RUF had achieved one of its objectives, to drive away much of the population from Sierra Leone's diamond fields. The RUF wanted to take Kono or the diamond areas because of the resources. In the coming years, diamond resources would fund a campaign of unparalleled terror and diamond mines would be transformed 
into forced labor camps. Many of the people working in the diamond fields were working at gunpoint. Before the start of the rebel war, Usman Kante was a typical Sierra Leonean teenager. But when he was just 17, Usman was abducted during an RUF raid on his hometown of Maburaka. We were in a motor car, in a truck, more than 100 of us. I thought that since we had been captured, they were going to kill us. They brought us here to suffer. They told us to mine. Diamond fields were turned into RUF-controlled forced labor camps, staffed by thousands of captured civilians. It was day and night, day and night. They would kill us if you tried to rest. You would have to go to the toilet right there where we worked. Physical exhaustion was very commonplace. In fact, it was a tactic of the RUF to wear out the miners so that they wouldn't be inclined to, to run away or flee. There wasn't enough food. They gave us Gary. We were slaves. If you decided to leave to find something to eat and you are caught, you will be killed. Rebels hovered over each captive, guarding against theft. Because if they suspect you having a diamond, pray to God at that time that when they say, where is the diamond, you say, here is it. If not, you lose your life. So that time they hope they one man we don't take that. Sometime when we were working, someone took a diamond and refused to give it back. They asked him for it, but he denied taking it. So he was interrogated. And when he insisted not taking it, he was shot and killed. He would now have to give it to them in the hereafter. Off the sweat of enslaved miners like Usman, rough diamonds poured in from the fields and were whisked out of the country along smuggling routes established decades before. They would be taken by trusted couriers and would go by land, by foot, uh, across the border and go to Monrovia. Locked in his own civil war, Liberian warlord Charles Taylor helped facilitate the illicit flow of conflict diamonds. He supported the Revolutionary United Front in Sierra Leone. He supported them because it was a way of destabilizing strong elements in the region, and it was also a way of paying for his war. RUF mined diamonds simultaneously funded two rebel war machines, one in Liberia, the other in Sierra Leone. In return for the diamonds, we need arms and ammunition. Arms like AK-47 rifles, GPMG, that is a general purpose machine guns, RPGs. FN long barreled rifles, surface to air missiles, uh, helicopters, helicopter parts. Ammunition was often delivered in million block orders. RUF control of Sierra Leone's diamonds served another strategic purpose. When we get these rich areas, that is the resources area, then the government will collapse economically it will not be able to finance its military. Little of the dwindling state revenue went to the military. Many disgruntled soldiers turned against the government. The soldiers were not really able to effectively prosecute the war. And uh, a lot of them became sobels, that is, soldier come rebels. And so that complicated the whole situation in the war front. The soldiers were joining forces with the rebels. And we're attacking towns, we're raping women, we're killing people. Stop, stop. With no one to protect civilians, in 1992, a warrior sect of the Sierra Leone Mende tribe known as the Kamajors took up arms against the RUF. That was the reason why we had civil militia, because people were complaining 
that their houses, their villages were being raised by military men, not even rebels. As anarchy reigned, children became emblematic of the conflict's human tragedy. Many were killed. Others did the killing. I think the number of child soldiers from our estimate was something like 20,000, which was quite high. The age range was something like seven years to 12 years, which is quite young. And most of these child soldiers were very, very aggressive. To provoke violent behavior, the RUF forced drugs and alcohol upon child soldiers. The majority of indentured children were boys, but girls were also targeted. They served as cooks, sex slaves, and soldiers. I didn't go with me. They took me away and I was sexually abused. They gave me a gun, but I didn't know how to use it, so I just held on to it. Lovette Freeman was 14 when she was abducted by the RUF. I did what they wanted me to do, because if I refused, they would threaten me with a knife. I did bad things. We went to a house to loot, and I was in front. They all waited in the back while I knocked on the door. A woman opened the door, and I pointed the gun at her. She staggered back, and we entered the house. I took the woman's baby from the house and took her away with me. I abducted her. She later died, and I felt so sorry for that baby. Children were often required to terrorize their own families. They would abduct young boys and girls, force them to kill their own people. And after that, they would say, we are your own parents now. And then they would use these little boys as front soldiers to attack other areas. There were platoons worth of child soldiers who knew really no parent figures except for those who were their commanders in their units. By the end of 1994, much of Sierra Leone had descended into chaos. Unable to curtail the RUF, Sierra Leone's ineffectual government hired a South African mercenary company called Executive Outcomes to restore order. The soldiers for hire were promised diamonds as pay. Executive outcomes had an effective air power, which they used to their advantage in the diamond area. They had one big aim, to clear those areas of rebels, because their whole pay depended on that. Executive outcomes quickly accomplished what no one else in Sierra Leone could. In just one month, they cleared the RUF out of most of the diamond-rich East. A resulting peace, albeit tenuous, allowed for elections in 1996. The RUF refused to participate. Former United Nations official Ahmad Tejan Kaba was elected president. Ahmad Tejan Kaba campaigned in a very simple way. They would help end the war and return this country to normalcy. Enough is enough. We should really try and stop the decline of our country. The new president initiated negotiations with the RUF. But hopes for peace quickly dimmed. At the urging of the UN, Kaba terminated the contract of executive outcomes. With no effective military force to stop them, the RUF relaunched its war. The RUF said that it was fighting against military rule and they were for democracy and they wanted peace and development. But when the military government left power and there was an elected government, they kept on fighting. To punish those who voted, the RUF would soon exact horrific retribution. In 1996, the war in Sierra Leone had entered its sixth year. Illicit diamonds had helped sustain a conflict 
that might have otherwise ended quickly. The amount of money that the RUF made from the diamonds in Sierra Leone is between 50 to 125 million dollars per annum during the time period that they had control over the diamond fields. With rebels well armed and funded, the war's remaining years would be marked by RUF brutality that defied comprehension. In response to the 1996 election of President Tejan Kaba, amputation became a rebel tactic of intimidation and revenge. They called us bastards and Tijan Kaba supporters. They said, Today would be the last day you meddle in politics. They ordered me to stretch my hand. I pleaded with them in the name of God. I told them right now, I have my children, my husband is unemployed, and I am the head of my family. They mocked me saying, stretch your hand and touch God. Residents were often asked, would you like to have short sleeves or long sleeves, which was code for do you want your hand chopped off at the wrist or at the elbow? In 1997, Kumba Imbendi, her husband and young son fled when the RUF attacked their hometown near Kono. We left there and moved to Tumbudu. When we got there, they were still chasing us so we stayed in the woods. At that time, I was four months pregnant. The RUF captured the family. Kumba's husband was dragged into the jungle. Three rebels accosted Kumba. I pleaded with him, but he started undressing me. I was stripped and I fell. I continued to plead that I was pregnant. But he responded by saying that wasn't his doing. He went into the farmhouse, came out with a stick, and inserted it right into me. I started bleeding. He was going to split my stomach open and remove my baby. Kumba's husband emerged from the jungle. Blood was spraying from his wrist area. He yelled. They cut my hands off. So I kept thinking, they cut my husband's hands off, they mutilated me. I asked him why they cut his hands off. He said they told him they did it because he voted for Tijan Kaba, that it was lesson, so they wouldn't do that anymore. your hand from the wall. Take off your hands out of the wall. That was the meaning of that chopping of hands. For the first half of the war, the capital of Freetown was mostly spared of RUF atrocities. Then in May 1997, soldiers from the Sierra Leone army overthrew President Kaba. The new military junta invited the rebels into Freetown as allies. Almost immediately, the RUF pillaged the city in what they called Operation Pay Yourself. These guys devised some uh, new but wicked strategies, and one of them was Operation Pay Yourself, where they would harass civilians, take whatever property they had, and, uh, and use uh, that property for their own ends. We went house to house looting. We took belongings, demanded money, and sometimes killed two or three of their family members. It was a war of stealing, grabbing, and taking illegally what you never worked for. But after enduring three decades of almost constant military rule, Freetown citizens took to the streets in protest. The general public refused to give them the support. People refused to send their kids to school. People refused to go to work. The demonstrators, they said they don't want to the junta. 
and that the government should come back. This means we were to go back to the bush, and we going back into the bush. In Freetown, the only army fit enough to fight the rebels was Ekamog, a Nigerian-led West African intervention force deployed in 1997. They ousted the junta, reinstated President Kaba, and drove the RUF out of Freetown. They now realize, painfully realize, that it was really not possible for them to stay in Freetown permanently and, and rule. And since that was not going to be possible, all Australians would suffer as a consequence. While they were retreating, they made sure they destroyed everything that was on its way, human beings, buildings, you know, clearing like locusts, anything that was on their way. People were so frightened. People were panicked. There were people who had been killed. There were reports of villages set ablaze, towns wiped by the rebels, children abducted. The RUF retreat took them east, where by the end of 1998, they again seized the diamond fields. The rebels rearmed and in January 1999, they marched back into Freetown. This time, it was little more than a murderous rampage. That was the most brutal experience that I witnessed. People were being forced into their houses. People, this was the time I had to go into hiding. You hear people being shot at. You hear people crying, rebels attacking them, women being brutalized, they were being raped in front of their children, in front of their husbands, in front of their family members. Ekamog forces still in Freetown launched a fierce defense of the city. But unable to always distinguish rebels from civilians, citizens at times fell victim to indiscriminate Ekamog aggression. Well, Freetown was was hell, to put it very crudely. There was complete anarchy and instability in this country. The Freetown massacre lasted just two weeks before Ekamog again drove the RUF out of the capital. But by then, 6,000 people had perished. Corpses piled up outside Freetown's Connett Hospital. The dead bodies that I saw, perhaps up to the day I die, I pray not to see that many dead people. And a once vibrant city was in ruins. Sierra Leone's cruel war was about to end and a shocking link connecting death and diamonds was about to be exposed. In the aftermath of the ruthless RUF assaults on Freetown in 1999, the international community, largely absent to this point, pushed diplomacy. With the United States and United Nations as brokers, warring parties met in Lomé, Togo in July 1999 and signed a peace agreement. It called for complete cessation of hostilities uh, from all parties. It also granted amnesty to all the fighting forces, including the RUF. It also called for some power sharing. The Lomé Peace Accord, probably one of the worst things that have been done in Africa in many, many, many years. The chief beneficiary of the Lomé Accord was imprisoned rebel leader Fode Sanko. The architect of RUF war crimes was handed the vice presidency. People said there will never be a military solution to this. There has to be a political solution. The political solution was to give the vice presidency of the country to a butcher. As vice president, Sanko was granted official oversight of Sierra Leone's diamond fields the very objective he sought through war. Sanko also conspired to overthrow the government. 
When you're dealing with a, a group as anarchic and as murderous as, as the RUF, it was very unlikely that they were ever going to settle for half the cake. They wanted full power. They still wanted the topmost position. Fode Sanko still wanted to become president of this country. The RUF was countered by a 6,000-strong UN peacekeeping force dispatched in October 1999. But for almost one year, peacekeepers simply avoided the Eastern Diamond Fields, still controlled by the RUF. Halfway across the world, a Canadian NGO called Partnership Africa Canada was working on peace-building projects for Sierra Leone. And one of the Sierra Leoneans in the group said, this thing is really about diamonds. Until somebody does something about diamonds, this thing will never be over. We began to research the subject, and sure enough, diamonds really were the heart of the matter. In January 2000, Partnership Africa Canada published a scathing report that exposed how diamonds funded the RUF's brutal war and human rights atrocities. One of those implicated was Charles Taylor, who had been elected Liberia's president in 1997. We found very clear evidence that a lot of diamonds were being moved from Sierra Leone through Monrovia, through the offices of Charles Taylor and his cronies, out into the bigger diamond world. The report charged De Beers with being a part of the conflict diamond problem. De Beers had closed its Sierra Leone office in 1985, but because of the company's long-held practice of buying up the majority of rough diamonds on the open market, the report concluded it was virtually inconceivable that De Beers was not indirectly purchasing Sierra Leone conflict diamonds. If you can't buy them in the country where they're mined, then you buy them somewhere else. In the end, they're all going to go into the same pot. So certainly they were buying diamonds that had been smuggled from a whole variety of places. De Beers itself did not buy any Sierra Leone diamonds from 1985 onwards, but clearly there were problems in terms of those diamonds from that country getting into certain channels, being smuggled and getting onto the international markets. Liberia was the first stop for most diamonds smuggled out of Sierra Leone. It also was a favorite hub for smugglers looking to launder illicit rough flowing from other African countries. In a two-year period, over $2 billion worth of diamonds had come into Antwerp, supposedly from Liberia. Yet none of these diamonds came from Liberia. Liberia itself has very few diamonds. This is a country that can't produce $10 million worth of diamonds a year. These were recorded as official figures coming into, into Belgium, in official Belgian trade figures. But all of these figures were being recorded without anybody batting an eye. Nobody was asking any questions. There was no regulation. There was no control of any kind. Illicit rough diamonds entered Antwerp, often accompanied by fraudulent paperwork printed on fake letterhead of fictitious companies. You would arrive at Belgian Customs and you'd have a, an invoice saying that you bought these diamonds in, in Liberia. You could have bought them anywhere. The report also showed that invoices were often falsified by listing a diamond shipment's last country of transport and not its country of origin. Many, many diamonds went through Swiss free ports, and so these were declared as Swiss diamonds. Switzerland, of course, doesn't have any diamonds. As negative press about conflict diamonds spread, the industry took notice. De Beers was the first to act. De Beers began to recognize that this was a real issue, and as the industry leader, they would have to make some changes in the way they do business. They realized that they actually had to do something for whatever reasons, whether it was altruistic or whether it was to protect the good name of diamonds, they did become involved. In 2000, De Beers stopped buying diamonds on the open market. De Beers was probably more aware of the conflict diamond issue than others, and basically said they would only buy diamonds from mines that they controlled or had a share in, so they knew exactly where the diamonds came from. And when we look at the absolute tragedy that was going on in Sierra Leone. This shot the world and it shot the diamond industry. And we very quickly wanted to become part of the solution in putting an end to this. Diamond should have nothing to do with these kind of activities. Of that, we were adamant. For an industry that had changed little over a century, a seismic shift had been started. The awareness of conflict diamonds, probably the biggest change to the diamond industry 
almost from the beginning. At the same time as Partnership Africa-Canada exposed the link between diamonds and the Sierra Leone conflict, the tenuous peace there unraveled. For the first few months, there was some relative peace. Soon, the rebels began attacking important areas. They began attacking people. But this time, the RUF would be crushed. In May 2000, a small but heavily armed British intervention force landed on the shores of Sierra Leone. The United Nations beefed up its force to more than 17,000 troops. Together, they routed remaining RUF strongholds. The RUF was stripped of power, and its leader, Fode Sanko, was arrested. On January 18, 2002, President Ahmad Tejan Kaba officially declared the end of one of the most brutal civil wars of the 20th century. Today, we're happy that those flames of war have been extinguished, and that now, we are about to watch the flames of peace destroy some of the implements of war. Four months later, Sierra Leoneans freely went to the polls. President Kaba was easily re-elected. Hundreds of citizens, whose hands had been severed to keep them from voting, bravely cast their ballots. In Sierra Leone and Angola, the atrocities funded in part by illicit diamonds had been exposed. But a shocking new allegation was about to be leveled. The connection between Al-Qaeda and diamonds first came to my attention shortly after the 9-11 attacks. On the morning of November 2nd, 2001, readers of the Washington Post awoke to a front page story connecting the trade of illicit diamonds to the world's most notorious terrorist organization. There's strong evidence that there were Al-Qaeda operatives in Liberia and that they went to Sierra Leone in the late 1990s and that they were buying diamonds. The revelation came by chance to Doug Farah then the chief of the post-West Africa Bureau. Farah was in Ghana, meeting with a longtime confidential source, a member of Charles Taylor's inner circle. He was looking at a Newsweek magazine that had come out just after the 9-11 attacks, and they had a list of the FBI most wanted on a two-page spread, and he suddenly went pale, and he said, I know these two guys and this guy down here. He said, what do, you, what do you mean you know them? He said, I was, I was sold diamonds to them earlier this year. I was with these people in the bush. I was like, holy cow. The men Farah's source identified were key Al-Qaeda operatives. Two of the gentlemen, uh, Gailani and Fazul Mohammed, were identified as being involved in the East African embassy bombings. And Abdullah Ahmed Abdullah was a fairly senior financial officer within Al-Qaeda. Farah's source described several face-to-face -face meetings between Al-Qaeda and the RUF. They had had a meeting in June and July of 2001 in Monrovia to negotiate a monopoly agreement to buy the entire diamond harvest of the RUF that year. And one of the incentives they gave was to pay 10 or 15 percent above the going rate for uncut stones. Farah followed the story to Sierra Leone, where senior RUF commanders corroborated it. His explosive article prompted further probes by the Special Court for Sierra Leone, a joint task force of several European intelligence agencies, and the NGO Global Witness, all substantiated Farah's account. The link between Al-Qaeda and diamonds really starts uh, in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. In the aftermath of the 1998 Al-Qaeda attacks on American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the United States froze the terrorist group's assets. Intelligence sources believe that Osama bin Laden needed to come up with a different financial structure for the next attack. And nothing fits the bill better than diamonds. They are portable, they are easily liquidated, and nobody can tell where they came from once they've left the source of origin. 
elements of the East African Al Qaeda cell moved to Liberia, to West Africa, and became involved in buying up millions of dollars worth of diamonds. They brought in a couple of people in 98, and then they had two permanent people there starting in December of 2000. And they rented a house starting in February of 2001. Coming just months after the 9-11 attacks, the reaction in Washington, D.C. to Farah's findings were mixed. The CIA and the FBI refused to believe it. Members of Congress kept demanding that the FBI and CIA investigate the stories. The FBI was twice sent to West Africa to study the diamond terrorism link. Which created a huge level of hostility within those agencies, being told by Congress to go spend resources on something they didn't think was important. The FBI and CIA provided classified reports about their investigations into the alleged Al-Qaeda diamond connection to the 9-11 Commission. Their official report contradicts the Washington Post story. It states, we have seen no persuasive evidence that Al-Qaeda funded itself by trading African conflict diamonds. By the turn of the century, very few disputed the fact that diamonds had helped fund brutal wars and human rights atrocities in Angola and Sierra Leone. The diamond industry was very concerned that the two NGOs that had exposed the problem, Global Witness and Partnership Africa Canada, might, might start a consumer boycott. This would be very damaging for countries like Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, where they're very dependent on, on diamonds and where there are no conflict diamonds. So the industry was concerned, and those governments were also concerned. The diamond industry joined with NGOs and diamond-producing countries to search for solutions. After several years of debate, a system of certifications was agreed upon and then implemented in 2003. It's called the Kimberley Process. The Kimberley Process Certification Scheme, which is its technical name, is a UN-sponsored trade agreement which requires any time rough diamonds cross international border that they be packaged in a tamper-resistant container and that they be accompanied by a government-validated Kimberley Process Certificate which lists the volume, the weight, the value of the rough diamonds. To date, more than 70 countries are members of the Kimberley process. I'm happy to report that the initial source of conflict diamonds, which were Angola and Sierra Leone, are both members of the Kimberley process. In the Sierra Leone government gold and diamond office, every batch of officially exported rough goes through a rigorous sorting, valuation, and certification process, all mandated by Kimberley. Once a certified and sealed shipment of rough is exported, it enters a diamond supply chain that eventually delivers the rough to dealers, polishers, and retailers around the globe. In addition to the Kimberley process, the industry agreed upon a voluntary system of self-regulation and warranties designed to guarantee the pedigree of diamond shipments in the supply chain. Used in conjunction with the Kimberley process, diamonds theoretically should be able to be tracked from their point of origin to the stores where they are sold. It goes through this complex system, but by the time it gets to a retail store, it is accompanied by a warranty. And the retailer can insist on these warranties so that they are in a position, if they are asked by a consumer, to tell the consumer that all of the diamonds that I sell in my store are covered by a warranty and that therefore they have no taint of conflict on them. But does the system work? It's estimated that conflict diamonds have been reduced to less than 1% of the world diamond trade, mainly attributable to the end of the major diamond-funded wars. And since the Kimberley process was implemented, legal diamond exports in former conflict zones are on the rise. I think one of the indications of success in the Kimberley process is what's happened in Sierra Leone. 
In 2002, I think Sierra Leone exported about $26 million worth of diamonds legally. In 2005, it exported $142 million legally. Critics, however, contend the system is not without flaws. Kimberley-compliant countries are required to institute internal controls to prevent illicit diamonds from entering the system, a formidable task in areas of widespread informal alluvial mining, such as former conflict zones. In a country like Sierra Leone, where you've got something like 180,000 artisanal diamond diggers, people who dig with a shovel and a sieve, many of them not licensed, very, very hard to know where the diamonds are coming from that are offered for export. Very hard to track all those diamonds right back to the mine. So unless an inspector is physically there to see that each individual diamond is pulled from a particular mine, there is no way that any regimen of certificates and checks or double checks is going to account for every single one of them. Diamonds could be coming into Sierra Leone from Liberia. Diamonds could be going out of Sierra Leone into Guinea. Also of concern to NGOs is that the system of warranties designed to track diamonds to the retail market does not allow for third-party reviews. This industry chain of warranties, this industry self-regulation is voluntary and there is no provision for audits. In our view, this is a, a, a weak link in the chain. A 2004 Global Witness undercover investigation revealed significant numbers of United States retailers were unable to produce conflict-free warranties when requested. But is there, um, I mean, is there like a warranty or something to say we don't trade in conflict? No, 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 there's no, no. no. We're always trying to improve the Kimberley process. We've all had some ideas on how to improve it. The NGOs, the governments, the industry. We're working those through. What remains to be seen is if the Kimberley process can be effective in a time of war. I remain convinced that no system of certificates and stamps of approval or digital pictures are going to eradicate this problem as long as there are armed groups who are acting in rebellion to a legitimate government of a country where diamonds are found. And as long as they can control diamonds, as long as they can extract the diamonds, those diamonds will get sold. In 2006, the United Nations reported that diamonds from the Ivory Coast were being mined by rebels and smuggled out of the country. Illicit stones from Liberia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo still make their way to the international diamond market. The major diamond-funded conflicts in Africa have mercifully come to an end. But in regions as volatile as West and Central Africa, some worry a war funded by diamonds could be triggered again. If you want to overthrow a government and you've got access to millions of dollars worth of diamonds, it's going to be easy to do. In post-war Sierra Leone, there exists an uneasy peace. Due to an unconditional amnesty granted to RUF combatants, war victims and the rebels who terrorize them are once again neighbors. And most of us consider the civil war as a long nightmare, and people are prepared to forgive, not necessarily to forget, and to forge ahead in the hope that they will never experience this kind of atrocities again. The Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission urges victims and perpetrators to find common ground. Killers are asked to offer remorse. Some people have died, some got lost. So all these people who, in one way or the other, fell victim of the war, we are to say sorry to them, and I extend my sympathy to them. Victims are asked to forgive. Not all can. So I don't feel fine. It doesn't feel I good. Sometimes I ask God to give me the power to meet the person who did this to me. We wouldn't be able to sit down like this and talk. A common grievance is government aid directed to perpetrators. In exchange for disarming, financial compensation was given to former RUF combatants. The ex-combatants 
were in a win-win situation. They went into the war, they committed atrocities, they loot property, they got, they got away with that, they got blanket amnesty, and they were trained, given money to go back into their communities, while the victims were in a lose-lose situation. They would rather help the armed rebels because of fear. We just barely survive. Nowhere is neglect more evident than at the Grafton camp for war wounded. We've been in this camp now since November 17th of the year 2000. Presently, we have 500 people. We don't have electricity. We don't have toilet facilities. And we have educational problems too. We need good schools. Designed as a temporary shelter, today, weather-worn tents serve as the residents' only refuge. One of the camp's residents is Kumba Imbindi. Now they are right now the sofa. We are still here and going through a lot of pain. We have suffered a great deal. During the war, several RUF rebel 